Oh, I love talking to ex-pastors. I just love it. <laughs> I love talking to people who have stood behind the pulpit. I don't know, were you a pulpit pounder? Uh, and do I call you DB or, or uh, uh, what's the most comfortable title? What do I call you during our conversation? Yeah, His Holiness. Will <laughs> Your Eminence. <laughs> uh, Dave, call me Dave. Yeah. Dave, uh, we'll formally introduce you, I guess, to start, right? Your former Baptist pastor. And, uh, you know, you're a product of Duke and Princeton. And Wait, aren't you a Mr. Fancy pants there. Uh, what did you study at Duke and Princeton? Let's start there. Yeah, well, let's take a step back. So I actually did my undergraduate work at Wake Forest, which at the time uh, was affiliated with the North Carolina Baptist Convention. Uh, Wake was the scourge and the pride of North Carolina Baptists. It was the pride because it was their academic flagship and arguably probably one of the most prominent Baptist colleges in the country. But it was the scourge because they knew there were fraternities and sororities on campus where beer was served and, God forbid, dancing. Uh, so I, I actually majored in religion, Seth, at Wake, with no, no intention, no thought of becoming a minister. Uh, I wasn't in the Baptist Student Union. I was in a fraternity. Uh, I was president of my fraternity. And it was said when uh, I made a decision to, to go to Duke Divinity School that our fraternity faculty advisor suffered his first heart attack. Uh, I think he said something along the lines of, I knew there was a serious bone in that boy's body. I just wasn't sure where it was. <laughs> well, it's all the dancing is what happened. You know, first of all, it's the yeah. liturgical yeah. movement. And then yeah, you've got the rebellion yeah, against God of, aspect of it, you know, Dave. So. A little bit of drinking, a lot of drinking, yeah. You realize, uh, I'm sure everybody says, Dave Ramsey, you share the name of the yeah. famous yeah. religious financial advisor with a, du a growingly dubious reputation, <laughs> right? Yeah, so that's why uh, my publicist for my first book, uh, and I knew this, said we, we have to come up with a slightly different uh, variation because any Google search with Dave Ramsey, you're, the guy you just mentioned pops up. So my full name is David Blair Ramsey. So she said, why not DB? And I said, let's go with it. Well, I mean, if I may, DB sounds like a – DB Ramsey sounds like a pastor. Sounds like he <laughs> came out of the womb, DB Ramsey. He will one day be clergy. Um <laughs> So how hardcore were you? I mean, were you that guy, the, you know, front row, typical, stereotypical, conservative, Baptist, we don't clap in church kind of a guy or, or what? It's interesting, Seth. I think I shared, I, I've read your book, Be Converted, and I think our childhood experiences of church were pretty similar. So I grew up uh, in a Baptist church, not fundamentalist, but, but conservative, middle of the road, pretty large. Uh, and, you know, from the time I was a teenager, all the way up to when my faith started uh, leaving me, I, I was very devout. So I was the guy going back to college. You know, I would be out partying Saturday night, but I would get up by myself and I would drive to church by myself and attend. So I was always I mean, uh, my faith was always central you know, to my uh, to my being. Uh, but I wasn't a, a, to go back to your first question. I wasn't a pulpit pounder. Uh, I brought intellect into the pulpit. Uh, I wasn't afraid uh, to do that. Um, in fact, one Sunday, one Easter Sunday morning, which you know is probably the most packed audience uh, in, uh, in, in Christian life, I uh, deconstructed the, the empty tomb story. And I, I said it like this, this morning, I'm going to tell you where the holes are in this story academically. Because if you don't know where they are, then your faith is pretty weak. And I said, I'm going to play the prosecuting attorney uh, I'm going to argue for the historicity of the empty tomb using historical, critical biblical scholarship. And then I'm going to attack the empty tomb story using the same historical biblical scholarship. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say no Baptist minister has ever done that on a Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning. I, I would bet my 401k uh, on that. And the reaction was actually very positive. Uh, I, I was pastor of a, of a downtown college church uh, that was moderate liberal, and the pulpit was free. Uh, I had several members that said, I never knew the other side. And I said, well, now you do. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that, I was that kind of Baptist minister. I'm so. going to get to your, uh, your book here in just a few. I don't want to be remiss in that because it's how I discovered you. And, and I find the title, <laughs> yeah, I find the title is Speaking of God, we don't know shit. I, I just think that's a great title. 
And it's a weird title for a former Baptist minister. Yeah. But, you know, you don't strike me as the frozen chosen type. I mean, I look at you and I, it, you do look a little bit like you could easily have a chair at the Southern Baptist Convention. I mean, I, were you involved in SBC or were you a different flavor of Baptist at the time? Yeah, so when I was, uh, you know, coming up through uh, seminary and then became a Baptist minister, my churches, if they hadn't already, had split from the Southern Baptist Convention. That was the big issue uh, in, in my day. And it's one of the reasons that I chose Duke for Divinity School. I was one of five Baptists at Duke. I wanted to see how other people did religion. I wanted to see how other people thought. But no, my churches uh, eventually were totally aligned with, I think it's called the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. And, and the SBC is in their you know, rearview mirror. So how many splinters of the Baptist church are, I mean, to say, first of all, that there was a split in the Southern Baptist is it's sort of a foregone conclusion. We've been reading the headlines over the past several years about scandal and division and theological differences. You know, the culture is changing. Will the SBC change with it? And that kind of infighting was going on at the time that you were religious, even preaching? Absolutely. Uh, and again, you know, the, the fact that I went to Duke uh, excluded me from several, you know, search committee lists. And and conversely, you know, if a church would not have me, uh, having gone to Duke, then I probably wouldn't be, you know, happy in that church. But uh, it was a, yeah, it was the beginning of the big splinter of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, which, it, it is, if you recall, Seth uh, began when uh, they plotted, and they would call it a hostile takeover, because as you know, in the Baptist Church, while there's no hierarchy. Every Baptist church hires and fires its own staff. They do their own thing. They're not beholden to any ecclesiastical authority. Uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, and, and particularly the president, uh, appoints people to the boards of trustees to seminaries. And so their goal was not only to elect a conservative president for the first time, probably in years, uh, their goal was to take over the seminaries, most of which they viewed to be too liberal, including Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in uh, in Old Wake Forest, North Carolina. Well, this gets us into, I feel like I'm putting the cart before the horse, like I'd saved this for later in the conversation, but we get into the quest for power. And this gets messy, right, Dave? I mean, sometimes it is rooted in the Great Commission, we were charged to go out and take over the culture, for lack of, a, lack of a better way of saying it. But it wasn't done with malice. Like, we don't want to go out and oppress people. We felt we were saving people. Like, the government was God's government. The planet did belong to Jesus. And then I think there were other people where they just see they've weaponized Christianity for power. And so let me just throw the word power out Forgive the broad question, Dave. You just take it where you want, okay? Yeah, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is Catherine Stewart's uh, recent book, The Power of Worshippers, where you know she spent two years uh, visiting, if not infiltrating, uh, you know, Christian evangelical movements. And her thesis, uh, the thesis of her book, is simply this: you know, the Christian nationalism is not so much about religion or theology; it's about power. And uh, to, to get really granular, uh, today's current evangelicals saw power residing in Donald Trump. Uh, and so that would allow them to hold their nose and say, oh, he's a, you know, he's a broken vessel. But uh, he delivers uh, on his word. And my gosh, we've just seen, you know, the ramifications of that with the recent Supreme Court rulings. Uh, and, and, and I would argue, Seth, you're going to if you haven't seen it already, you're going to see statements like God sent Donald Trump. God, you know, Donald Trump was anointed by God because we turned back Roe v. Wade. Uh, you know, that's that's an observation. But that when I think of power, I, I think of that, and I think you're spot on. I think it's disingenuous for that movement to say, uh, you know, this is all about saving souls. No, it's it's about taking their brand of uh, evangelical Christianity and imposing it on almost every facet of society, schools. Uh, economic institutions just go on, you know, down the line, prayer in schools, et cetera. Well, you know, where I start to throw up a little bit in my mouth is, um, well, the Lord sometimes uses flawed people. It's kind of the King Cyrus argument, yeah. right? Yeah. So no matter how 
anti-Jesus. The guy, I mean, if you were to ask about the greatest attributes of Christ, if you were to cherry pick them out of the New Testament, charity and humility and, you know, taking care of the poor and and uh, telling the truth, you know, sort of a, a, a genuine, sincere nobility. They, uh, it trumps the antithesis of what Jesus represented. And to see the evangelical movement just, not just support, but often adore this guy, just makes me freaking crazy. Yeah, and it's interesting, Seth, that same presumption of God using a broken vessel wasn't uh, applied to Bill Clinton. Uh, you know, his, his infamous, can I say, blowjob <laughs> tells in comparison to, to, you know, to Trump's antics. But uh, I actually I wrote an essay and it's, it's a chapter in my uh, in my next book, which I'm trying to finish. And, and it was called How Donald Trump Became God. And I cite Catherine Stewart's thesis of uh, how Christian evangelicals uh, desire power and, and Trump's, you know, his Trump himself, Trump's base has power. The other the other. Uh, part of that thesis was uh, H. Richard Niebuhr wrote a book years ago called The Meaning of Revelation. And, and his thesis is really interesting. So, you know, look at uh, historical events on one plane. You know, those are indisputable historical facts that have been documented, one of which is Donald Trump became the 45th president. On top of that layer, Niebuhr argues, is an interpretation of that historical event. God sent Donald Trump. Donald Trump is, you know, this broken earthen vessel. But Niebuhr goes on to say only one of those planes is verifiable. The, the, the interpretation, the, the, the theological layer is purely, utterly subjective. Uh, and again, there's an interesting double standard that, you know, was not given uh, to other presidents like you know, Clinton, not that I'm trying to defend Clinton's behavior, but it's just interesting. I think there is a double standard there. It's, I'm sure, frustrating for some in the audience. I get hate mail, and I hate mail, but angry mail. How come you have to talk politics? I don't want to. Like, it's not, they forced our hand, Dave, right? Yep. I mean, it's, yep. this is an unholy marriage. Religion and politics in this country, sort of a, a rampant push toward theocracy. They make us do it. I mean, come to my defense, right? Well, Seth, and then it begs the question, okay, if theocracy, then who's theocracy? And if you say Christianity, okay, which brand of Christianity? Uh, you know, uh, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, you know, uh, kind of created this uh, framework for understanding the world, the, the quadrilateral. And Wesley argued that, yes, the Bible is part of that, but so is reason, scripture, and experience. Well, there would be some evangelical Christians who would say, no, the Bible says what it means, means what it says. It's in the infallible word of God. But then who interprets that? You know, all texts require interpretation. And, and as I was reading your or actually listening to your book, Seth, while going on several runs, I, I, I couldn't help but smile when you brought up the, the, the catalog of pornography in, in the Old Testament, you know, the, incestu <laughs> the incestuous relationships. They, and I'm going to use another bad word here, the gangbang. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you, you want to know where that uh, started? Go to Genesis and you'll see the gangbang. I mean, it's utterly, and I'm actually, I'm going to shamelessly pirate some of the, the verses that you put in your book because most Christians, number one, don't know they're there. Number two, if they're there, they conveniently overlook them. But you want to get a book out of the out of the schools that is, you know, utterly, uh, you know, pornographic and violent. No, by the way, God is, is his hand is often directing the violence, you know, dashing babies' heads against the rocks. Look at the Passover, killing the firstborn of Egyptians. That's, that's God. And, and I'll, I'll tell you this, Seth, I was on a, uh, a debate, uh, and I'll never do it again, uh, last year with an with a evangelical scholar. And the, the question of the debate was, does evil disprove the God of Christianity? And my response, my opening was, well, God can't be proven, period. So, you know, I'll concede the argument. But uh, it, the, God of the, the God of the Bible is evil. And I said, just look at the flood story. If that story is true, God drowned innocent children, people. And I threw that back to my opponent. And he said, well, that's God's prerogative. And I'm like, what? God can do what God wants to do. So at the end, and I'm sure, Seth, you've heard this numerous times, uh, he said, well, I'm going to pray for you. And I, I, I didn't respond in kind, but I thought, I'm going to pray that you'll come to your senses and understand that drowning innocent children is evil. Uh, 
Uh, it's I'll, a I'll, little pa- often more than just passive aggressive. I'll pray for you is kind of sometimes the equivalent of I'm sorry you're so terribly ignorant and wrong and misguided <clears throat> and misled by the evil one. But uh, I'll abide you. <laughs> you know, at least we can stay in the same room. But you poor, poor man. Uh, that's how I hear yeah. I'll pray for you. Yep. Uh, yeah. Were you a Bible literalist? I mean, an actual Adam, Eve, there was a no. flood. No? As a Baptist no. preacher? No, no. Uh, you know, I remember Seth as a, as a well, child teenager. Uh, you know, I didn't really develop critical thinking skills until my mid to late 20s. You know, I, I, I would often believe whatever I was told. But one thing bothered me. And I remember one Sunday going up to the uh, minister after the service. And this is a common uh, critique of Christianity. I'm like, so you're telling me that if an African Bushman, you know, never hears of Jesus Christ, that he's going to hell. The, my minister smartly said, well, that's one of the mysteries of the faith. He dodged the, you know, he dodged the question. So that was always in the back of my mind. But uh, no, probably by the time I was a late teenager, I, I, I did not read Genesis literally and certainly, you know, not as an adult. And then, you know, the, the breaking point for me in my book, as you know, uh, came uh, in, in grad school uh, reading Rudolf Bultmann. Bultmann was a New Testament scholar who argued that really to understand the New Testament, you have to peel away the layers of myth that had accrued to that story. And, and I would now argue a, a lot of it is myth, if not all of it. And I enjoyed your debate with Bart Ehrman. And you posed the question to him more than once. Do you think there was historical Jesus? And he 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 answered quite authoritatively and quite quite forcefully. And I wanted to say, well, you know, and he said, there's no scholar. There's no scholar that would hold that. Well, there are mythicist scholars. Richard Carrier, I believe, is the one that carries that banner. Uh, not, yeah, I'm not sure if it's a carrier who, who would yeah. argue there was not a historical Jesus. And, the, and the, the defense of that position is there are very few, if any, extra biblical references to Jesus outside of the New Testament, which the New Testament, if it were a term paper, would get an F because it's self-referential. You know, someone says, well, it's, you know, it says so in the Bible. Well, where, where is this historical event outside the Bible? There's no mention of Jesus in Roman literature art, music, uh, zilch, zero, nada. Tacitus and Josephus uh, mentioned Jesus, Josephus in a footnote, but even those uh, scant mentions uh, are ha- have been challenged by scholars who, who say those could be forgeries. Oh, so, I love the uh, Bible stories that have no corroboration outside. I think my favorite example is at the crucifixion of Christ, when the dead saints rise up out of their graves and they parade through the streets of Jerusalem, and no contemporary historian thought that was noteworthy enough <laughs> to chronicle, right? The, the zombie apocalypse. And, and, and Seth, here's, here's the, this is the biggest problem for me, and it should be for all sentient Christians. So, you know, when somebody approaches, first of all, I don't force my uh, agnosticism on anyone, but if you bait me, if you draw me into an argument, I say, first of all, I'm going to wear you out. I'm just warning you. I'm going to wear you out. And I'm going to start with a really simple question. What is the earliest writing of the New Testament? I'm going to give you a head start. It's not Matthew. Most Christians do not know or care that Paul's writings are the earliest of the New Testament. You know, Paul writing sometime, you know, 40 to 50 A.D. Uh, guess what Paul does not write about? He doesn't write about the empty tomb. He doesn't write about the virgin birth. He doesn't write about the miracles. Well, why not? I mean, did, did he consider those irrelevant to his apology, uh, apology of Christianity? Uh, did he think they were really, uh, you know, myths? Or had those myths not been created yet? Because guess what? If you thought your guy was divine in that time and place, you had to write a miraculous birth story, miracles during life, and something miraculous post Post death, for your guy to get a seat at the table of divine men. And oh, by the way, there were other divine men in that time and place. That was oh. when Christianity started kind of falling apart for me. Well, you know, it's such a challenge. I spoke recently, I was at an event in Fort Wayne, and we were, I was on a panel and we were talking about changing minds, and I was expressing my frustration because when I first came out of the faith, I used to think, well, I, I've got the data. So I walk into the room and I've got a devout believer and they give me that look, you know, that sort of look of piety and holiness and, uh, you know, kind of a superiority. 
uh, it, not necessarily maliciously, but they definitely feel that they have divine favor and are in the right. And so I just show them, well, there were four conflicting accounts of the empty tomb, right? This is different than this is different. It doesn't make any difference. I mean, they either have an apologetic to skate, you know, the reporting, that's various reporters each giving a vantage, or they just don't care. And that's kind of where I am now in my activism. People keep asking, how do we change minds? And I'm becoming more and more. I mean, I think the data is important, but I'm just not convinced we change the culture with data. I don't know. Dave, speak to me. What do you think? Well, again, I go back to your deconverted. Uh, if I remember, Seth, for you, uh, it, it was a series of tragedies, not personal, but I think you reference a Christian musician yeah. who was killed in a horrible uh, automobile accident. And he and his friend were rejected from their car. Then a semi ran over, you know, the guy. Yeah. And it, it, again, I, I, if I remember correctly, that kind of set in motion for you the beginning of, you know, how do you reconcile a good, omniscient God with with that, which is the theodicy issue. Uh, but to your question, Seth, I think it starts one person at a time. Well, and um, if I can interject quickly, to, I want yeah. I probably need a qualifier. I'm talking about the one on ones with an interlocutor oh, yeah. in person. Yeah. I'm not. I think data. Okay. I think on the macro level, we definitely go after the facts. But if I'm standing yeah. eye to eye, face to face, voice yeah. to voice with someone, and say, "Here's the data," I have yeah. had no success. So that's the context. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and so I kind of I kind of go above that when when somebody makes a statement, a religious statement, including I believe in God, I ask two things. One, how do you know that? And two, who taught you that? Two simple questions. How do you know that? Epistemologically, how do you know that? And who taught you that? Because let's face it, we don't know. None of us knows. We believe, we hope, no one knows. Number two, most of us were taught uh, everything that fills our brain. And you, you also referenced the insidious indoctrination of children, which Sadly, I not only was, and I'm going to use the word victim of, but I perpetuated it. And, and of that, I'm ashamed. Uh, we take children before their uh, minds have been developed, and they are so impressionable, and they believe what their parents tell them. They believe what elders tell them. And then at some point in their maturity, they reach the point where their belief system is indistinguishable from their personhood. And to attack their or challenge their belief system is to challenge their person. Uh, but I, 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 I still one person at a time. And again, I don't lead with my story. Uh, but if someone approaches me, then I will kind of gently and, and persuasively just say, who taught you that? How do you know that? That's a good starting place, right? What was it? Uh, the two major determiners from my perspective uh, and this is not an original thought. Yeah. Uh, this is borrowed. But, uh, you know, where were you born and what was the religion of your parents? A a absolutely. And isn't it, isn't it amazing that you were born into the right religion? It's amazing to me. You know, I mean, and I'll often use that example. If you were born in Yemen, what are the chances you would be uh, Pentecostal? Right? If you were born in Mexico, what are the chances, you know, you would not be Catholic or an Eastern religion from, you know, Asia, et cetera. And, and you can even do that by denomination, right? I mean, we look at the South and we see Baptist uh, Assembly of God or Pentecostal. Then you go further North and I see a lot of Catholic Lutheran, you know, Episcopal yeah. kind of thing. I mean, have you noticed that you can, you can almost determine it by part of the country, part of the world. Yeah. I forget which theologian coined the term, the accident of our birth. Uh, none of us ask to be born, period. And none of us ask to be born into the family or climb or religion uh, or, or political party. Not, I would take your argument, carry out, you know, if your parents were Republicans, chances are you are. Uh, it, it's uh, Birth is so determinant of so many things, particularly religion. Then we've got the cultural and familial reinforcers. If you start to think for yourself, right, you start to bend the membrane of that particular belief system or conviction, there are punitive measures, right? If, you, if you're not towing the line, we will either cast you off or condemn you. And that's tragic because that's my inbox. I'm sure you've heard the stories. Were you penalized in some way when you walked away from the faith? Did you feel the fallout? You know, I've been asked that, and I've met people who did have fallout. Uh, my friends are still my friends, and, you know, I've had— some, you know, some of the same friends for most of my lifetime. And, and they're not at the same place I am. Uh, 
you know, I think it disappointed my mother, uh, maybe even embarrassed her. Uh, but, you know, she seemingly got over it. It would, quite honestly, lead to the eventual dissolution of my marriage. Uh, you know, my, my wife at the time was fully supportive of what I was going through. She knew every step of the way, you know, that I began to have so many doubts, doubts that overcame uh, my faith. But at some point, you know, we started a family and I just didn't go to church, Seth. And, and just to give you a, a perspective of my family's church, it's a Baptist church. They have a lesbian staff member. Uh, she was married in that church uh, to another lesbian. They have gays and lesbians who serve as deacons. Uh, let that kind of sink in. This is a very liberal Baptist church, which, which may seem ox- oxymoronic, but they believe in God. And, and, and the minister who's liberal believes in God. And at one point I said to my wife, I'll go if you'll let me raise my hand and say, how do you know that? Who taught you that? Because if you, if you, if you answer the question, who taught you that, you will go back invariably to a time when that person who taught that person knew less about the world than my daughters when they were 12 years old. I mean, that's the, that's the logical extension of that argument. But uh, no, my, my friendships remain intact, but it eventually would, would end my 30-year marriage. Talking here with former pastor D.B. Ramsey, Dave Ramsey. I want to get into your book in just a second. When you were behind the pulpit... You were already going through it. I mean, you said you were in seminary right? or uh, uh, in grad school when you started yes. to wrestle. I mean, what's how do you formulate a sermon when you may be going on that journey? Yeah, so I, you know, I came out of Duke uh, certainly challenged. Uh, you know, I did see a lot of the New Testament as myth, but I had several colleagues who were in that boat. Uh, when you go through. Uh, a seminary education uh, at an accredited institution where, you know, higher biblical criticism is is examined, uh, you can't help but be changed. And so when I entered the pulpit, I still believed in God, uh, but I, I saw a lot of the uh, a lot of Christianity as myth. But the, the decline, and I hate to use that word because it was actually freeing. It was actually redemptive, but it was painful because here's here's the, the, the thing, Seth, and I write this in my book. It's one thing if you lose your faith, if you're just sitting in the pew. Uh, it's another when it's how you feed your family. It would, And I say in my book, it would be like a, a professional baseball pitcher losing his fastball. It would be like a pilot losing his vision. I had I, I had no other means of supporting you know my my wife and myself. So it was probably the last two years of my of my career when I really began the, the slide to, I'm not even sure if, if God exists and what we can say about that God. But I write in my book, if anyone had been paying attention the last two years of my career, they would have noticed the absence of a pretty central character you know, in the Bible, namely God. So my sermons became almost exclusively existential. My prayers were vague and vapid. So I didn't really compromise my integrity or my intellect. I just knew that I couldn't do this for the rest of my life. And I had just to be just uh, to be clear, Seth, I had uh, a mentor at Duke and a mentor at Princeton, both of whom said, you do not need to leave the ministry. The church needs your voice. It's kind of then they compared it to Paul Tillich, who was an influential systematic theologian. And I just said, I can't do this. You know, I, I can't stand up here. I think these people want and deserve more. Uh, and so I walked away at the age of 35. I'm always interested in people who are behind the pulpit who speak honestly, very candidly, very courageously about the challenges they're having and what happens in the culture, or at least religious culture. I'm thinking of Rob Bell, and you know he's preaching about how he doesn't think hell is moral. And, and uh, the same with uh, a local pastor, Carlton Pearson. This was uh, 20 years ago. He just said, I, I just don't buy that. I don't think a loving God would ever create hell. And the mainstream fundy faith, just they just expelled him. I mean, they vilified them, they cast them off. And so in my mind, when I heard former pastor, I was thinking, well, the second you started mitigating and mellowing and <laughs> criticizing, then they kicked you to the curb, but that wasn't the case. No, no. Uh, I would say uh, in both congregations, I, you know, was, was in the category of beloved. Uh, you know, I, I sir, oh my gosh, I was not forced out. Uh, it, it was very painful. And I later heard from church members that they felt abandoned. 
And, you know, I, I did not from the pulpit uh, get granular about my reasons. Uh, I didn't say, you know, I'm agnostic or atheist. Uh, but no, uh, I, I was was fairly well received. Uh, but I, I could just no longer stand up there with fingers crossed and, you know, hands behind, you know, behind my back or whatever and, and do what I did. And so at 35, I started my life over uh, from right. scratch. Tell me about the book. You, you, you're like, I think a lot of us, right? We come out and we're like, I have so much to say on this subject and I want to make a difference. How can I? I'm sure the uh, crusader in you, do you have an activist nature? And uh, how did that sort of feed into the book if those are connected? Yeah. So, I, so you know, you, you had mentioned the title. You know, the title is intentionally crass and provocative. I didn't want anyone buying it and going, oh, I thought this was a devotional book. Really? You thought a book that had the word shit in the title was a devotional. Uh, so so it, it, it's intentionally crass. And if you've read the book, there there's some F-bombs, you know, sprinkled in there. Uh, no, I wrote the book, Seth, with one singular person in mind. If there was any minister who was going through what I went through and who read my book and said, I'm not alone, that was enough for me. Because when I went through, uh, you know, my, my crisis, there was no Internet. You know, I thought I was the only minister who was losing his faith. I was driving out of town because everybody knew me in this college town uh, to see a psychologist, only to be told, no, you're not crazy. This happens. So I wrote the book primarily for any minister who might be going through what I was going through. But the other I wanted to tackle uh, some of the popular but horribly misguided religious notions like everything happens for a reason. It was his time to go. God has a plan for your life. Those chapters and really the whole book had been in my head percolating for years. Uh, when I left ministry, I started a family and a career and I just didn't have time to write. But when I did, uh, it, it was for that purpose. I wouldn't call myself an activist, but no, I don't I shy. I would. <laughs> I'm sorry. To, I mean, you get to decide how you end up. But I look at you and I think there's a guy who wants to be a part of the solution. And that's sort of how I subjectively define it. But go ahead. Go ahead. No, th Then I agree. Yeah, I, I agree. I think if it's only one person at a time, and I can tell you, I've had feedback from people who said, you really changed uh, the way I look at things now. Um, and that's how it starts. That's how social change start, start, uh, starts, Seth. And think about it. No social change has ever occurred from a position of safety. I had a, a childhood friend who, when he learned of my book, said, aren't you afraid of, of what might happen to you? And I said, not really. You know, if somebody wants to kill me, I'm ready to go. I've led a good life. But, and I told him, I said, no significant social change has ever come from the center or has ever come from a position of safety. What was that line by Hitch? Um, oh, I wish I had it in front of me, but there can be no, I don't know, improvement of society was his, without head on confrontation. I think of, obviously he was more of an anti-theist. I take a little bit, I love Hitch, but I take a little oh. bit more of a mitigated approach, you know? So, and forgive me for butchering the quote. I, I have the memory of a goldfish, and so that's happening more and more. I love age. No, I, I love Hitchens, and he he is missed because he, he had such a towering intellect, and he could take on and dismantle, you know, the the, the common uh, apologetic uh, defense of Christianity just almost like with a razor. You know, he well, was just, you know, when uh, God is Not Great came out, it was interesting. He had the option to do his book tour anyway, and he said, you know, I'm going to go to the Bible Belt. I mean, he went in right to the lion's den. <laughs> and I'll tell you what I like about him. For me, hey, I was strong, and, uh, you know, he could be really biting, and, you know, he could go on the attack. But even when he was strong, when he was standing on stage with the apologist, etc., I did not see him unkind. I uh, He... I mean, some would disagree, but I saw him as he was generous and he was gracious and he was polite to his interlocutors, even those he vehemently disagreed with. And I'm like, I'd like to do that. I want to walk in and be strong. Don't take any crap, right? Don't give them quarter whenever they say something insane, but also not be raging and pounding and carrying on like a madman. Uh, you know, he didn't need to do that. He could be strong without sort of being unhinged. And I'd like to emulate that in my own life, you know. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, and and he, he took emotion out of the arguments. He was just very matter of fact, very philosophical, uh, because these kind of conversations can get emotional. But, you know, emotion should not 
enter into a philosophical argument. And, and one of the, the weakest and laziest forms of argument, as you know, Seth, is the ad hominem you know, arguments. You're, you're getting attacked. It's the attack of an institution or person instead of uh, arguing the merits of, of the subject. Uh, I remember I had uh, finished Duke. And I'd gone back to Wake Forest for a pastor's school in the summer. And one of my former professors, a New Testament professor, uh, Dr. Charles Talbert, and I was one of his prized pupils. Uh, we're in a small group and we get into a discussion that turned into a debate. And I don't remember the subject, but I remember making my argument. And Dr. Talbert said, Dave, that's just Duke talking. And I wanted to say, is really that's your best? You know, that's your best argument is that's Duke talking. Uh, that is ad hominem with a capital A and a capital H. But it's it's typical of a lot of the uh, of the arguments uh, toward people like you and, and myself. Well, oh, I here's think one too, you know, it's if they look at us and say, you're stupid or you're and atheists have done this to religious people. And it drives me crazy. Right. Uh, I wasn't I wasn't a, a stupid when I was a believer. I was a victim of bad ideas. Right. And well. Go ahead. So I'm sure you've heard this, Seth. I think you brought it up in your book. You were never a Christian. You know, you were never really a Christian. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my story there. So I had written a letter to the Wall Street Journal uh, in response to an article about a, a, a scientist who had become a Christian. And in my letter, I, and, and he, had, he had made some straw man, straw man arguments about atheism that I disagreed with. So I wrote the letter and I kind of left it at that. I got a text from a uh, I'm going to use friend in air quotes. He was a member at my country club. And the text, he, he actually saw it in the Wall Street Journal, sent it to me and said, David, you were never a Christian. Swallow your pride. And Seth, I was so, I mean, I was so angry. I wanted to drop F-bomb after F. <laughs> F, F you smug, yeah. arrogant, sumptuous, sanctimonious, pious F-tard. But instead, I simply did not respond and I blocked it. But Seth, I, I gave up eight or 10 good earning years. I was all in. And, and, you know, ministers don't make a lot of money. Do you think, and, and I was incredibly all in. Christ was at the center of my life to a point. God was. I believed it. But guess what? Things happen. Things change. And people change as well. But don't say you were never a Christian. And, and that's probably the one that stings and hurts the most. It's really a dismissive approach to somebody who may have gone through a lot of people who go through deconversion, deconstruction, also experience a lot of trauma. You spoke to identity. Um, I like the way you phrased how, you know, and I used to say, well, when I lost my faith, but when we phrase it like that, it, it does feel like a, like a net negative and it hasn't been for me. It's been very much a net positive. So I've been trying to say it differently. I don't know. You've been doing the same, like when I deconstructed or when I walked away. I mean, that kind of thing. Yeah, oh, I agree. Uh, it, for me, it was incredibly liberating. Uh, I mean, I remember my last Sunday in the pulpit, my wife at the time came into my study and she was crying. She goes, isn't this sad for you? And I'm like, this is so liberating. You know, I finally got this weight off of my back. And uh, I, again, I think in your book, you refer to the God glasses. You know, when you take those glasses off, you see things in such a different and beautiful light. Uh, and, and no, it was incredibly powerful for me. Uh, redemptive. Uh, yes, it was a crisis because I did it for a living. That's what made it problematic for me. Is this how I, I had prepared for this academically? You know, I was good at this. I mean, Seth, I would, you know, week in, week out, I would write a sermon. I would finish it on Thursday, take Friday off. And on Saturday, I would commit it to memory. And on Sunday, I would take nothing in the pulpit, no notes, no manuscript. I mean, that takes a lot of effort and work. But I did that because it freed me to make eye contact with the congregation, to, to kind of gauge the reaction to certain things that I was saying. Uh, but to be told you were never a Christian, oh, man, that— if, if that guy had been in front of me, I, I, I would him. <laughs> well, yeah, there's also sometimes this lazy idea that, you know, pastors, they're all just shills, fill in their pockets in the name of God. And I'm like, you don't know pastors because you said it, right? I mean, we look at the mega pastors. This is not the, the pastorate. Most of them make a pretty meager wage. 
They do a lot of work. They're on call freaking 24-7 with hospital visits, and their phones are ringing all the time, and they're being pawed at with every need from the congregation. You have to be a special kind of person, I think, to be a pastor. And, and I think we need to be more charitable when we talk about people in the clergy, right? Oh, so, I mean, I now make anywhere from 10 to 12 times what I made in my best year uh, as a minister, but I have one-tenth the pressure. And I work for a very large company, Amazon, and, and, and I've had pretty big roles in my sales career with pressure. Nothing pales, nothing compares to the pressures I felt uh, as a minister of growing the church numerically, financially. And, and, and let's face it, 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 all churches, it comes down to that. Call it saving souls, call it baptisms. But at the end of the day, as one uh, curmudgeon in my second church said to me, unfiltered, we pay you to put butts in seats. Well, he said the quiet part out loud. Hmm. And and I felt that pressure. And, and oh, by the way, it's only gotten worse. If, you, if you've noticed, the percentage of nuns in surveys has increased. The percentage of people who say they believe in God has decreased. Uh, and I'd like to think that it is somewhat attributable to things like or books that are written by guys like you and me, debates that are had. And and I hate this sound. This does sound condescending, but people coming to their senses because. That's what it was for me. And I was not stupid. And that's why I, I can't I, I don't want to be pejorative. I believed almost everything uh, you've believed or others have believed at some point in my life. They, they, they're just no longer tenable for me. Well, um, oh, I just totally lost my train of thought and I had a great point. This happens right. more and more as I get older, Dave. It just happens oh, all the you're time. Younger, you're younger than I am. <laughs> why, why you're thinking, Yeah. Uh, did you happen to read my last chapter, not the epilogue, the last chapter about Job? Yeah, I read the whole thing, yeah. So, uh, I, I, so that, to me, I looked at a Bible story, the book of Job, and I looked at it as a piece of literature, and I looked at the character of God. You know, who takes Satan on, it, it takes a bet from Satan to just utterly F with this guy's life. So th- for your for your listeners and viewers, the title of that chapter is the book of Job. This God has a gambling problem and he's a dick. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if, if you look at God as a character in the Bible, particularly in some of those Old Testament stories that you cite in your book, he's not a very uh, redeemable character. He's actually a monster. Uh, and yet I found... Christians go to such great lengths to defend God at the sacrifice of their own intellect and integrity. And that's fascinating to me is they they want to defend God and and, uh, in spite of and in midst of horrible tragedies. Well, uh, I should probably give you my American Express number for all the times you've mentioned my book deconverted in this conversation. I mean, I just feel like maybe I maybe I owe you for that. That's weird. Um, But, you know, I think you and I have walked a lot of the same steps. And, um, you know, you're involved with the clergy project. I think that's probably as we draw to a close where I want to go next, there's an underground of people in the pulpit who are, or have deconstructed and yet they're sort of pot committed, right? This is my education. This is how I pay the mortgage and feed my family. And what else would I do? I can't imagine. I mean, I thought I wrestled staring at the ceiling, racked up in the middle of the night. Uh, I can't imagine what it's like for a pastor. Yeah, and, and the older you get, Seth, the harder it is, I think, to leave because you you don't know anything else. It's all you've been trained to do. Uh, I, I knew guys that were millimeters from where I was at the time, and they almost to a person said, I don't have your courage. I, I just don't have your courage. Uh, but no, the clergy project was not around when I was going through what I did. And an interesting story, uh, you know, I, I signed up and I get an email that says, we need to interview you. I'm like, what? And so, you know, this guy calls me and he starts asking. I said, all right, is there a dogma to this? Like, is there a, a test that I have to pass to prove that? He said, no, church members, when we first started, would sign up and they would try to out their ministers. So we make sure that your motives are pure and that you're not a church member trying to find your minister in this group, but, oh, there are untold numbers of ministers who are where pretty close to where you and I are. It's all they know how to do. I guess I should have been more clear for those who don't know what the clergy project is. It is an anonymous, I would call it an organization, a, a hub for people who are in the pulpits, who are pastors, who are either going through a journey or have just deconverted outright. 
and they needed a place to go and a safe place where they wouldn't be outed. You say some people would would sign up or try to sign up in a clandestine way just to just to out the pastor. That's that's insidious. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. Uh, but again, they have safeguards okay, to good. you know. As we put a cap on things, um, final sort of pitch for the book, what it is and why it matters. Yes, so the book, Speaking of God, We Don't Know Shit, a former minister uh, looks at God and religion. Uh, It's a story of of my uh, deconstruction, if you will, from uh, Christianity to agnosticism and from uh, being a Baptist minister to agnosticism. Uh, It takes on uh, some popular but misguided religious notions like everything happens for a reason. It was his time to go. God has a plan for your life. It's peppered with stories, uh, many of which are from my experience as a minister and some of the horrible tragedies I saw and the often hollow responses to those tragedies. But I would say if anyone uh, has ever had a doubt, and that's all of us, about their faith, about Christianity, uh, read the book. I, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised uh, at what's in it. Former evangelical author, activist, D.B. Ramsey, Dave Ramsey, who is not the other Dave Ramsey. My friend, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for sharing your story, and thanks for talking to me today. Yeah, thanks, Seth, for having me. I appreciate it.